We support free speech here at WMAL. Can't say the same thing about all of our institutions, though, unfortunately. Remember, Donald Trump wins in 2016 on the strength of his ability to circumvent the corporate media. But after that, well, the big tech companies, the corporate news outlets, they all clamped down on Trump and the people who supported him. And it's happening all over the planet now. Few people understand it better than my next guest. Mike Benz joins us now. He's the executive director of the Foundation for Freedom Online and a former State Department diplomat. Mike, thank you so much for taking some time today, sir. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. I, I really appreciate it. And I have to say, uh, I, uh, I, I have received uh, messages from so many people over the course of the last week who saw your interview with Tucker Carlson. Tucker uh, did a big interview with you and shared it to social media. And uh, it's being passed around like hotcakes right now. Uh, everybody wants to hear what Mike Benz has to say because you really do have a very detailed knowledge of the way our institutions work and the way that they've been censoring speech um, in kind of covert ways. Mike, Mike, how did you get into this business? Well, uh, I was a corporate lawyer. I, I worked on M and A and hedge funds and private equity for the first you know seven eight years of my career. But I'd always been an avid chess player and something really strange happened that sort of took my life sideways in late 2016. Uh, in August 2016, I came across uh, just kind of doing my own research on the internet about some of the things I was seeing about in that censorship. And I came across uh, basically, you know, documents around the creation of uh, an artificial intelligence censorship technique. Uh, it's called natural language processing. And it basically, yeah, I, I looked at it and I, I said, wow, this works really similar to the way chess engines work when they analyze a chess position, uh, except it, you know, this is, this is for human words. And I lived through that period when I was a, a little kid of Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov and totally, uh, you know, rendering humans helpless against this. So before I really was even apprised of the censorship industry and the government's role in it and all the different institutions and networks and funding sources and all of that, uh, at the very early outset, before it was even really applied domestically, uh, I began a, writing a book and a documentary about the threat that this was going to cause because I figured if, if, if machines could do that to humans in the chess field, then we had no chance on social media. There would be no freedom of speech in the Western world again. And so I embarked on this path that I thought was essentially my calling. I, I left law and I I joined the Trump administration, and I tried to tell everybody in D.C. about this. But at the time, no one could really appreciate it from 2017 to, you know, all the way up until, you know, basically mid to late 2020. It was uh, no one wanted to believe that this industry was being created around Internet censorship. No one wanted to believe that, you know, these new technological tools are being used in order to proactively ban speech rather, you know, by the millions rather than reactively doing this kind of whack-a-mole um, you know, manual moderation. And, you know, so I, I've basically been, been doing this for eight years straight and, yes. you know, it did just sort of come out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, and obviously the, Trump's election is not the only event, uh, where the internet proved to be a place where you could circumvent, uh, the traditional realms of communication. But I, I, it does seem like a lot has changed since 2016. Uh, Mike, Mike, how much has the information environment changed in just the last eight years? Oh, it's, it's, it's completely ended the golden age of the internet. I mean, there's, there's, it's night and day, everything about it has changed because remember beyond the simple act of censorship itself, there was a sense from 2006 to 2016, you know, social media was sort of a, you know, you had Facebook in 2004 and YouTube 2005, Twitter 2006, smartphone 2007. There was basically 10 years of centralized internet social media speech where in addition to never being censored for what you said, you also had platform security in the sense that there was a, there was a feeling that, you know, if you could just uh, make great content, then you could scale your, uh, your little one small voice to the size of the New York Times. There was no, there was never any sort of institutional force or terms of service policy threat that would that would make an ordinary citizen feel like there was a, a ceiling on how far they could go to extend their microphone if they were speaking truth or or producing popular content. But the, so the the culture has changed. The uh, the but you know in, in particular 
um, you know, we now live under we now live under the dominion of you know these things I call weapons of mass deletion. Every word you say on the internet, every uh, you know, every sentence you write, every every Facebook post you do, every YouTube video you know has a speech to text transliteration for the closed captioning. It all gets broken down into individual words. All of those words are then analyzed by tens of thousands of different trust and safety filters, which all basically intermediate your ability to reach other audiences. And every every politically sensitive narrative is has a has a complex topography of trust and safety layers in order to rig the 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 field of play in favor of establishment narratives. You know, as you're saying all this, I'm also thinking of um, Apple just announced a couple weeks ago that every podcast on the internet that is served through Apple, which would include, by the way, this show, we we distribute our podcasts everywhere, including on Apple products, uh, is now going to have automatically generated transcripts. Uh, and yeah. th so this is not just a matter of convenience. It's also, as you point out, a matter of censorship. Yeah. And but, you know, so, so I initially started the story writing, you know, writing this book that I've been pregnant with for eight years, uh, The Weapons of Mass Deletion. But, you know, by 2018, I they had already come home. They were they basically came home in in late 2017 after a bunch of European laws forced U.S. tech companies to adopt them. And then uh, so I started wide, widening my lens to, you know, this concept of the censorship industry. And it was really through that that, it, you know, what you just said. I think is uh, you know is interesting to touch on, which is that in a, in addition to you know you, you mentioned these automatic transcripts, and so there's you know the, the way automated censorship works is it's it's through mapping words and and relationships between words and trying to sort of suss sentiment, and it, it ultimately affixes every sentence or phrase with a sort of toxicity score that if it's above a certain confidence interval will trip a certain trust and safety layer, a censorship right. layer. Right. And, you know, what's, what's really interesting about that, you know, in particular is in addition to the technological side of that, the, the censorship industry is comprised of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if you include NATO countries of, of manually employed academic researchers and, and NGO, you know, salaried NGO, uh, blob monsters, if you will, whose job is to chronicle emerging the words that we use in order to keep the censorship um, algorithms constantly up to date in a kind of evolutionary arms race against whatever is going viral. And so you have tens of thousands of people who are now employed by not just the platforms, but by 60 different U.S. universities uh, in America who all get their funding from your tax dollars, the National Science Foundation has spent about 60 to 70 million dollars spread across uh, uh, over 60 U.S. universities who uh, who get paid to form these so-called rapid response units in order to map you know, all of everything that you're saying. If you belong to a, whatever the grant is for, for climate misinformation, abortion misinformation, immigration misinformation, election misinformation, COVID misinformation. The, the sky's the limit. Every single sensitive policy issue can now be rigged essentially by the hand of God by combining this kind of, you know, chess engine style technology. But instead of in a, you know, in a children's game, it's it's, uh, you know, the stakes of democracy itself. Yes. You know, for it, this, the idea behind this, to the extent that anyone rationalizes this type of industry or this type of activity, is that it's designed to keep us safe. Right. It's, it goes back to. Uh, back decades, the idea that the government would listen for certain keywords on a phone call to intercept sort of threats going on uh, in the United States. And we're constantly being sold on, hey, there's a meaningful threat to the United States, a threat to our peace and our liberty, uh, and we can tackle it so long as we have this technology. Uh, and I can see why somebody might sell us that, especially to stop something like a terrorist attack. But the broad definitions here of what the threats are are really kind of out of control, aren't they, Mike? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think what you're saying was true from 2017 to 2019, when you know when the censorship industry was just getting started here in the U.S. under the predicate of RussiaGate, Russian interference, and Russia being a hostile foreign nation state, so you could sort of wander in a national security predicate. But they don't even they don't even do that anymore. They don't even need that. You know, it's it's uh, you know, I mean, I'll, 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 <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security had an office called the Office of Misdis and Malinformation. 
uh, there was nothing, you know, it wasn't about taking out violent harm. They didn't even, they didn't even attempt to draw a line. It was just, uh, you know, they made the argument that uh, elections are critical infrastructure. And uh, if you deny the, the safety and reliability of mail-in ballots, uh, you are undermining public, public faith and, and, uh, and confidence in elections. And therefore, you are, uh, <laughs> you are committing an, an attack against uh, U.S. critical infrastructure, a cyber attack against U.S. critical infrastructure um, by simply tweeting that uh, you don't think mail-in ballots are a good idea. They're, I mean, uh, that's the, they, they don't even try that. I mean, we're, we're, we're so we're, we're actually past the national yes. security predicate in so many respects. I, I remember a phrase that stands out to me ever since I first heard it. I was like, boy, that's Orwellian. The idea that our critical infrastructure includes something called our cognitive infrastructure, as well, that yes. our that our minds are a part of the infrastructure that the government needs to manage. Well, NATO has a whole field of study called cognitive security. So does the Pentagon. Um, you know, this is uh, this is you know, this is what I was describing in the, in the Tucker interview and and many others. If, if folks want to check me out on Twitter at Mike Ben Cyber, you'll see just run a search for my handle at Mike Ben Cyber with the phrase cognitive security or NATO, and you'll see all of this. Uh, but, but, you know, th there's, there's an entire field of study, and I shouldn't just, I mean, it's not just study. I mean, it's, it's, it's DARPA, it's, uh, it's places like the Minerva Initiative, which is the PSYOP Center of the Pentagon. It's all of these, you know, C the, the, whole, the entire armada of CIA cutouts, like the National Endowment for Democracy, and uh, the other NGOs and, and university centers, plus private sector censorship mercenary firms like NewsGuard and others, that all form this whole of society censorship network that was deliberately set up that way that's their term not yes. mine uh they they say it so frequently that they will apologize on their own zoom calls for using the phrase because it is it is a it's so trite and cliche to themselves from having sort of hypnotically repeated so, the mantra for so many years so so why does the traditional media root all of this censorship on in your view is it is it a product of uh, them wanting to protect their incumbency. They, 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 they don't like the threat of up and comers or the individual Twitter account getting the kind of attention that the New York Times uh, thought that it was entitled to. Or is, is it a matter of, of political preference? They're trying to guard their ideology from any sort of naysayers or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, they're, 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 they were on the verge of death by the end of 2016. You know, I mean, that one of the reasons that they that they clamored so hard you know, to the boot heel of the national security state and, and, and uh, you know, had zero hesitation to join this whole society censorship drive was because all of their business models were getting totally crushed by the fact that all the, that traffic was rushing to, to social media and to the to, you know, citizen journalists. You know, and this is what I mentioned, you know, on the, on the Tucker segment. I mean, I remember 2017, 2018, you know, watching all of these you know, these panels with four star generals and heads of the CIA and NSA, and they're, they're all talking about, the, you know, how the rules based international order is going to come apart if, uh, if, if the New York Times is reduced to a medium sized Facebook page. And, you know, so there's, there's a couple of stakeholders in that. One is, and this is the other side of what, of what you were saying uh, and that I agree with, which is that um, the, the analogy that I give here is, is a game of thummy war. And, you know, the, uh, you know how you can do that little uh, pointer finger trick in order to sort of cheat and take down your opponent's thumb with a sort of sneak attack that uh -huh. you, you, can't, you can't really stop? <laughs> well, you know, there was a thummy war going on between legacy media and, and social media voices. And, uh, you know, the social media thumb was killing the legacy media thumb. But the, the big, bad, pointy finger, you know, sneak attack that should be illegal, but you can't stop if someone does it to you, uh, is the national security state. So it was, the, it was perfect because all of their interests were completely aligned. It, it was populist parties who were rising to power, and the national security state wanted to stop that for political and economic reasons. And it was those same populist groups that were rising on social media and that were developing their own robust social uh, – uh, third-party media ecosystem. These were places like Breitbart. Now, remember, Breitbart in 2016 was, was estimated to be on par to catching up to Fox News. Now, they got crushed in 2017 because 99% of their ad revenue, as was most of the, the rest of the conservative yes. news ecosystem, was, was, was killed precisely because of this CIA, Pentagon, State Department, foreign policy awesome. uh, establishment blob plan 
which they, you know, which, which, I, you know, I have all of that stuff on my website, all yeah. the receipts around how institutions like NewsGuard and Project Al and the, you know, the authoritative news re-ranking and the, and the plot to kill $2.6 billion in programmatic ad, ever, ever, ad revenue spread yes. across the conservative news media. I'm very familiar with this. I, I was, I'm the former editor in chief of the Daily Caller and, and we were constantly dealing with things like this. And, uh, and this is, so Breitbart experienced what we also experienced in addition to the threats to ad revenue that the left was manufacturing here, that these institutions were manufacturing. Uh, you also had uh, algorithmic censorship. You had conservative websites yeah. being removed entirely from Google results. You could literally search verbatim headlines from conservative websites, and they would not show up on Google because Google was, uh, as the as well, the language goes, right. deplatforming them. Right. Right. Well, well, in April 2017, Google launched something called Project Owl, which was the which was a formal reordering of all of its search rank results um, to uh, to blacklist. To, to, to whitelist so-called authoritative news, they created this whitelist, blacklist, graylist system, basically a news cartel. And if you didn't belong to, you know, the, the clique of, of Pentagon back-channeled news outlets like the New York Times or the Washington Post, then you were, you know, you were either buried 10 pages deep where no one goes um, or, or not searchable at all. Yeah. For, and everything was reordered. So that so-called authoritative sources, which just meant, you know, a regime approved, blob approved news sources. I mean, they created a, a news cartel is what they did. And they were very open about it, I should add. I mean, these conferences that that the that CIA so, cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy would, would hold, they would talk openly about the need to bankrupt the alternative news ecosystem and, and to shoot the messengers, you know, to, to kill the message. Finally, Mike, and, and thank you so much for your time. In the next 30 seconds or so, can you give me an assessment of – uh, what the state of play go- is going into the 2024 election? How how pronounced are these threats now? Um, they've they've changed significantly in the past year and a half because we we were able to achieve many victories in 2023, and there have been many changes to the chessboard, so to speak. The, and the two main threats right now are the the codification of the regulations around the EU Digital Services Act, which before your eyes glaze over, that's NATO's international censorship bill. That's that's the Western military alliance's uh, uh, banning of anything that's so-called disinformation, and that is what you know could be a Twitter killer if it uh, if it is not dealt with. Um, and and it's hard to think of a way to deal with it because the only force that could really stop it would be the U.S. State Department applying diplomatic pressure on the EU right. not to not to apply this law. But the Biden administration asked for this, and they're not going to do that. So this is so it, it places you know I mean. If, if Twitter, for example, is, um, you know, is, is banned from Europe or forced to censor whatever NATO calls disinformation, then NATO said, you know, whatever NATO says, and, you know, when I refer to NATO here, I'm referring to the whole stakeholder set around NATO as well. I mean, that's going to mean, you know, all of the, you know, you might call them deep state forces around our foreign policy blob here in the U.S., uh, that that it's it's all those collective interests that are going to be represented. So any sensitive policy issue that uh, that they perceive their political opponents to be on the wrong side of will be deemed disinformation. And if you don't censor it, you're going to be kicked out of the European market, which yes. is a larger market than the U.S. one, 500 million people there, or yeah. pay a six percent global annual revenue you know uh, uh, penalty. The, the, so it's. It's very dicey how that will play out. That's the number one threat. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to. I, I, if if you'd be so kind, I'd love to have you back. I want. I want to talk uh, as well at some point about the rise of AI and the role that's playing in all of this too. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. I, I genuinely appreciate your time. Mike Benz, B E N Z. Follow him Great. on social yep. media. And thank you, Mike. Yep.